go through the rest of the agenda here. So our, our next meeting is March 13th at Citrus College, and they'll be talking about their construction, ma construction management and real estate programs there. So that's a uh, free dinner, free parking um, on the 13th of March. Um, we will be having, or we have had in the past, kind of happy hour mixers once a month. So hope to have that again in March sometime. So look for an announcement of that and, and we can get together for a, a more relaxed, um, just time to talk to each other. Um, if you have any feedback on this program or ideas for future pro programs, you can email us at email at mediatech.org. Uh, after the program, stick around. And if you're interested, we're going to go across the street and have uh, after presentation refreshments and continue the conversation. So just stick around and we'll go over there together. Um, so Medea, just a quick background. We're a 501c3 nonprofit educational organization. Our mission is to ensure the technical, scientific, and industrial workforce are are connected and have the resources they need by having programs such as this on entrepreneurship, uh, business operations and finance, uh, technology development and commercialization, and again, trying to bring people together to connect and collaborate. So with that, I will move on to our presentation. Dr. Robert Kirshner, he is the executive director of the 30 meter tele telescope international observatory, a graduate of Harvard College, Dr. Kirshner received his PhD in astronomy from Caltech. After a postdoc appointment at Kitt Peak National Observatory, he served on the faculty at the University of Michigan for nine years before moving to Harvard for 31 years. That included service as the astronomy department chair, director of optical and infrared astronomy, master of Quincy House, and closed professor of science. From 2015, 2022, Dr. Kirshner was Chief Program Officer for Science at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Dr. Kirshner is an author of 407 refereed scientific papers that have been cited more than 70,000 times. <laughs> he is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and other learned societies. He has served as president of the American Astronomical Society, received the James Craig Watson Medal of the National Academy for Outstanding Contributions to the Science of Astronomy, and was awarded the Wolf Prize in Physics for work that led to the discovery of cosmic acceleration. His popular level book, which I guess means we can read it, yeah. um, <laughs> is The Extravagant Universe, Exploding Stars, Dark Energy, and the Accelerating Universe. It has won awards when it was published by Princeton University Press and is available in English, Spanish, Portuguese, Japanese, Chinese, and Czech. So please welcome Dr. Kirshner. After that extensive introduction, I can barely wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> All right. That says here this meeting is being recorded. Good luck. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, you mentioned briefly that I was a graduate student at Caltech, which was a formative experience. And here I am 50 years later, uh, living uh, within walking distance of the Caltech campus. I tell you, it's been a long orbit. <laughs> okay. Well, what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight, not for too long, because I see it's a very diverse audience and you know, I'll be interested to hear the kind, different kinds of questions that you might ask. Uh, I'm going to talk about the 30 meter telescope, which is a project based uh, in Pasadena with our laboratory in Monrovia that is trying to build the world's largest telescope. The biggest ones now are 10 meters across and this aperture, the, the diameter of the mirror is gonna be 30 meters, so that's three times bigger, but it's really nine times the area. And I'll try to convince you it's 81 times better. Uh, so Caltech, yes. So just for your amusement, just for your amusement, how do I do this? How do I advance the slide? Probably this. Uh, just for your amusement, <clears throat> here's my ID card from uh, Caltech. So proof. Except for the hair, which has changed color. My signature actually is quite quite simple. Okay. Uh, so we're interested in big questions like what's the world made of? Can I turn off the light? Sure. Well, 
I'm, well, I'm not afraid of it. <laughs> I'm not afraid of the dark. Oh, that's exactly the wrong one. The wrong one. It's not away from the other one. I don't know. Boy, <laughs> you're lucky we got the screen. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. All right. Everybody okay? <laughs> Wait a moment. Your eyes will adapt. Okay. Uh, so we're interested in big questions. What is the world made of? Well, you know the answer in the old days was air, earth, fire, and water. Well, we've moved on from that to a, a, whoa, a more detailed story uh, that involves uh, the periodic table. But I also want to talk about the context in which those elements, which you are made, uh, got generated. Um, and it's, of course, in the expanding universe through the action of stars. Stars generate their energy through nuclear fusion. That means they take the light elements, hydrogen and helium, and they fuse them into heavier ones like the carbon that's in your, in you know, all those organic molecules we were hearing about a little minute ago, the calcium that's in your bones, uh, the, uh, well, in the old days, we used to have uh, mercury uh, in the fillings of our teeth, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's not maybe the best idea ever. Anyway, here is a kind of depiction of the history of the universe. Uh, it's about 14 billion years old, we reckon, from the current rate of expansion and the size of things. I'll talk about that a little bit. And the history includes this hot Big Bang at the earliest moment, uh, a period of expansion, but then slowing down under the action of gravity. The equations that govern that are Einstein's equations of general relativity. And then something really funny happened uh, we discovered about 20 years ago, which is that the expansion, which was slowing down, has started to speed up again. And this seems quite mysterious, but uh, we think we understand at least what the name of it is. Uh, and uh, pretty soon we'll understand what it really is. Uh, it's what we call the, the cosmic acceleration or the dark energy. Okay, so just to uh, pick up again on the uh, biographical stuff, because it's interesting, I think, for an entrepreneurial group like this, Here's Gordon Moore and his wife, Betty. Uh, as you know, uh, Gordon Moore uh, was one of the founders of Intel. <clears throat> and they did make these little integrated circuits on a chip. And that turned out to be a really good idea. Uh, and so uh, Gordon, of course, is known uh, for this law that named after him, where he had noticed that the price was going down and the number of uh, transistors on the chip was going up exponentially. So this is a log plot vertically and a linear plot horizontally. So back here, 1970, so I was a graduate student at Caltech back here, uh, and the uh, transistor count on a chip has doubled roughly every two years. Coincidentally, Gordon's fortune doubled <laughs> I actually worked it out. And uh, when it got to be 10 to the ninth dollars, billion dollars, he started to think, you know, I don't need this. And he's a very modest fellow. He was a very modest fellow. He died just last year. Uh, and uh, he set up a foundation, Gordon Betty Moore, and and Betty set up a foundation to pursue their interests. Uh, and Gordon's, uh, interestingly enough, was not so much in technology as in science itself. And so he has been a big benefactor for uh, science. But he's also, the technology has been a, a, a great benefit uh, to science. Here's Bev Oak, who was a professor at Caltech, my thesis advisor. And uh, he's shown here with one of the largest charge coupled devices, a light sensing uh, uh, chip, silicon chip, uh, from the 1980s, and it is at 0.24 megapixels. And you can see how happy it made him. <laughs> well, uh, the price of happiness or the, you know, the cost of happiness has gone up, uh, but the effect is the same. Here's uh, one of my, here is one of my contemporaries, uh, 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 John Tonry at the University of Hawaii, and he's looking at a gigapixel man that he built up 
Uh, there, Moore's law about more transistors on the chip, well, C C D three R, same thing, fabricated the same way out of the same stuff, uh, have uh, now uh, gotten much larger, and they make people happy. <laughs> He's wearing a mask, but you can see it in his eyes. That is a happy astronomer. Okay, so the technology is important. Uh, and I'll, I'll circle back to that, of course. Well, uh, here's a beautiful picture of a galaxy with a dot down in the corner there. That is a single star that exploded like travel to us across the distance from this particular galaxy. And this is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see this supernova, a very bright thing. We spent a lot of time, I and my students spent a lot of time trying to understand what supernovae are, how they happen, and so on. And we were lucky enough to be able to use them to measure distances in the universe to unravel the history of cosmic expansion that I was talking about a few minutes ago. So you can read all about this is the best book I could recommend. <laughs> <laughs> the Extravagant Universe. And uh, uh, I uh, heard that there was an international edition being published called Princeton University Press. And I said, oh, please, please send me all the translations. And they said, the check is in the mail. <laughs> uh, they did say that. <laughs> all right. Now where are we? Good. Okay. All right. So uh, what did we find? Well, we found something really interesting, which is that the expansion, the expansion of the universe. <laughs> come on here. Slide advance, please. How does it do it? There we go. Uh, the expansion of the universe, which I said was governed by Einstein's equations. It turns out Einstein actually, when he started out, didn't know about the expansion of the universe. That was discovered at Mount Wilson by Edmund Hubble and company uh, in, about 1920, in the 1920s. Uh, Einstein, when he formulated general relativity, thought the universe was static. He knew that gravity would pull in. So we added in by hand for no reason other than to agree with what he thought the astronomers were telling him. A, a, a term, the cosmological term, the cosmological constant. This is widely reputed to be, not by him, uh, to be uh, Einstein's greatest blunder, which he was said. Uh, no one can find where he said it or wrote it, anything, but we still repeat it. Uh, and uh, so what we found in the late 1990s was that the expansion of the universe is not slowing down. It's actually speeding up. And we did it by using those supernovae to measure things. So here you can see Einstein. He's pretty surprised. The interesting thing is the quantitative part. The dark energy, that's what we call it, uh, that's making the universe accelerate, turns out to be most of the energy density of the universe. The dark matter is the stuff that is pulling the galaxy, keeping the galaxies, uh, keep, keeping the stars in orbits in the galaxies and the galaxies moving around each other. The atoms that we're made of and that make up the stars that you see are just 4% of the universe, 4% of the mass of the universe. So this is a really weird picture in which the things you see are dominated by things you cannot see. It sounds a little spooky. I, I like this, though, because, uh, you know, atoms, well, we're kind of working on that. That's sort of a uh, number of you mentioned things that have to do with chemistry, you broadly put. Cold, dark matter, well, that's sort of physics. And the dark energy, that's astronomy. So if you were going to, if you were a dean at a university, this is probably how you would want to allocate uh, your research. <laughs> but what I want to assure you is that our reservoir of ignorance is vast. We don't know what the dark energy really is. Is it the cosmological constant or something else? We don't know what the dark matter is. Is it the, the lightest supersymmetric particle that was very fashionable for a long time? Still haven't found it. Uh, 
Atoms, okay, there's still plenty more to know about atoms too, um, especially as they agglomerate to make uh, uh, stars and planets and people. All right, but the thing I wanna to emphasize tonight is uh, instrumentation, the technological side. And I told, showed you those chips, that's how we detect the light. And the telescopes are how we gather the light. So here's a picture of uh, Galileo uh, showing off his new telescope in, in uh, Venice. Uh, of course, they thought of it as a mostly military thing. But anyway, he used it for astronomical observations. And of course, found there were craters on the moon. It's interesting. The moon was not some other kind of thing. It's like mountains on the Earth. That Jupiter has moons that go around it just like the solar system, only that was sort of in debate, what was the arrangement of things in the solar system. And he found the phases of Venus, you know, the moon gets lit from one side and the other. Well, Venus gets lit from one side and the other as it goes around the sun. Very strong argument that in fact, the planets were going around the sun. So that was pretty good, Galileo. Uh, and uh, here's what he said. He said, all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is to discover them. And so uh, what I want to talk about is the idea of discovery using instruments uh, at like the 30 meter telescope. Okay, so just to, uh, uh, well, it's a little painful, but I think I'll tell you anyway. Uh, this story of cosmic acceleration worked out pretty well for my graduate students. So here they are in Stockholm, receiving from the hands of the king, the Nobel Prize. And I thought, gee, we got started on that project when we were graduate students and it's worked out pretty well. So all I can say is I could only think of one thing better. <laughs> Not being in the orchestra. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Uh, so what about the future here? Okay, what are the prospects for bigger telescopes, better knowledge, understanding the universe better? Uh, this is not the picture I want. Anyway. Okay, so I show you this picture. It's kind of uh, 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 shows you a mock-up, full scale, of the James Webb Space Telescope and Ellen Ochoa four-time astronaut, um, leader of the Johnson Space Flight Center and chairman of the National Science Board for a while. Anyway, here's a picture of Ellen out in front of the uh, 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 James Webb Space Telescope. And you can see that the mirror there is made up of these hexagons. Those are beryllium, in fact, so don't lick them. Uh, and has uh, gold on the top not very much gold, but it's really good at reflecting infrared light. And that instrument that you've heard about is in orbit around the sun uh, a million miles from the Earth and was launched not so long ago. In fact, uh, here's a picture showing the first um, pictures from the space telescope. It even got the president's attention. So here he is paying attention. I just want to point out you notice they put people in hexagons because that's kind of what the mirrors are. And the person in the middle there is Nancy Levison, who was a student with me, an undergraduate student, uh, who did her senior thesis with me uh, at Harvard and was at that time the interim director of the Space Telescope Science Institute. So, you know, that's good. Okay, and here's what that image uh, looked like. These are galaxies, the fuzzy things are galaxies. They're just a few stars, like that big bright one up there, which uh, uh, you can tell because they have this uh, uh, six-fold uh, scattering from the supports of the secondary mirror. But most of the things you're seeing here are systems of a hundred billion stars at large distances. And you can see there's something funny going on. There's a great big galaxy here, massive, has a lot of dark matter in it, I think. And the effect of that is to do what Einstein predicted, that is to bend the light as it goes by. And you can see these arcs. They are images of galaxies in the background. 
that have been distorted by the presence of these massive objects uh, along our line of sight. So it's a uh, it's an astonishing thing. Uh, the thing that JWST is so good at is receiving infrared light. Turns out the Earth's atmosphere emits a lot in the infrared, absorbs in the infrared. Not good. All those molecules. Oh, anyway, uh, if only we could get rid of the atmosphere. You know, think like don't. Uh, anyway, the uh, 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 images are very sharp compared to what you can ordinarily do from the ground. But I'll show you, we have some tricks about uh, images from the ground. Okay. So uh, what should we do on the ground? Well, the astronomical community gets together every 10 years and produces a decadal uh, report. These are uh, uh, good if you have insomnia and so on. You're in the report. But the top priority of this uh, report is build bigger ground-based telescopes up in the 20 to 40 meter range. And the reason is, first, that they're technologically ready, that is, we've been working on it for 10 years already, uh, and because of the re uh, readiness of the projects, and because they can work at the diffraction, that is, the sharpness of the image isn't set by the wigglingness of the atmosphere to perform the right tricks. It's set by the diameter of the mirror compared to the wavelength of light. And if you can do that, uh, you can make sharper images with a big telescope on the ground than you can with the Hubble Space Telescope, or you can with JWST. So that was their recommendation. NSF has been a little slow implementing it, I can tell you, but we have hope. Uh, and here's our uh, idea about where to go with this uh, with this. So this is an image of the 30 meter telescopes kind of hiding in there uh, inside an enclosure. You know, the telescope needs to be able to point to any part of the sky and the, the dome has to rotate around there so you can see out. Unlike telescopes in cartoons, it does not, the telescope does not stick out of the dome, you know, <laughs> inside. But this is a, a, a quite an unusual design that we think will use less material. It'll be uh, lower uh, and less conspicuous uh, at its site, which I'll come back to. All right, what about this business of somehow, somehow, making the atmosphere, which is moving around wiggling whatever look through a telescope, or if you know, you know, if you look along the highway on a hot day, you see that the images in the background are distorted by the difference in the bending of light due to stuff at different temperatures. We know how to compensate for that now. You have to have a thing that you know is a star. And here, the thing, is uh, you see this laser beam going up from the telescope, goes up to the ionosphere, where it excites uh, sodium atoms. And uh, it makes a fairly small spot, which comes back to the telescope and can be used as a reference so that you can correct for the wiggles in the atmosphere across the aperture. It's uh, adaptive optics. It's a technology that the military developed Think they wanted to look at other people's satellites and uh but it came across uh into uh astronomical use uh in the 80s and so on and gordon moore helped uh with uh, that our plan is to put two to two of these telescopes one in the northern hemisphere ours the 30 meter telescope and uh, there's another group also based in pasadena the giant Magellan telescope. So you might run into some of those people. Don't be confused. <laughs> it's good. This is wonderful. Uh, <laughs> and they're going to build this thing in the Southern Hemisphere uh, uh, at their observatory in Chile at Las Campanas, a place that I've worked myself. Okay, so that's the plan in response to this community you know, assessment of where we should go. And what's it for? Well, how about finding a planet like Earth around another star? That seems like a good thing to do. Uh, you know, whether it turns out that the biochemical experiment of planetary atmospheres 
results in life all the time? I don't know, and neither do you, but uh, we're all interested in it, and it will be really uh, uh, fascinating to see how this uh, variety of experiments that nature has carried out works. Uh, there's new physics. I talked a little bit about dark matter and dark energy. There are also, uh, Caltech, you know, has been one of the places that has pioneered the study of gravitational waves. That is, when uh, an object collapses or big objects spiral into each other, they ripple the fabric of space and time and send out at the speed of light uh, these vibrations, which can be measured. The LIGO interferometer uh, developed at MIT and Caltech uh, has actually seen these things. They're real. Uh, and uh, But we don't know that much about the events that create them. We'd really like to know more. What's more, I showed you a picture of a very some very distant galaxies behind a, an intermediate one, and their images were distorted. We'd like to go all the way back to the very first galaxies, see where the chemistry of those first galaxies might have been, how the stars formed, how they worked. And we know that there are black holes in those centers of galaxies. I'll show you a little bit about that. We like to, and it seems like almost every galaxy has a, a black hole in it, a big one in the middle. Um, but we don't know which came first. Chicken. Yeah, it's the black hole in the galaxy. Do the galaxies form around the black hole, or does the black hole form as a natural product of the evolution of things in the galaxy? We really don't know that very well. And that seems like an important part of the story of how things got to be where they, you know, the way they are. Okay, so this shows that we're actually doing some of this now, not at a 30 meter telescope, because we haven't built that yet, but at 10 meter telescopes. This is a picture of the summit at Mount Akea in Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii. <coughs> and it shows the two Keck telescopes. Um, the Keck Foundation gave a bunch of money for the to build these things. And you can see they both have lasers uh, going up into the twilight sky. And they're using this kind of adaptive optics to do interesting things. What are the what's an interesting thing they can do? I'll show you in a second. This. Okay, so what does this technique of adaptive optics do? It, it, yeah, as I said, it takes out the effect of the wiggles in your atmosphere, and it allows you to get images that are as sharp as nature will allow, as the physics of light will allow, if you do it right. Okay, so here's a simulation. This is not real, but it looks really good. It will, I promise. Uh, the blurry stuff on the right is more or less what you would get looking up through the Earth's atmosphere, and it's uh, in homogeneity, in temperature. That's a typical sort of thing uh, that you might see in a big telescope. And this shows the improvement that you get by going above the Earth's atmosphere with the Hubble Space Telescope. Very good. We've been using the Hubble Space Telescope to great advantage uh, for the last 20 years or so. Um, this shows the better imaging that you get with the James Webb Space Telescope. It's bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope and produces uh, sharper, better images. And here's what we'll get with the uh, 30 meter telescope, way better. Now, what's way better good for? Way better is good for, of course, telling big blobs from individual stars. If you want to study those individual stars, this is much better. Uh, and of course, um, it's sharper in two dimensions. That is, you know, up and down and across. Each time it's sharper by something proportional to the diameter. So that goes, it's better by the diameter squared. And the area goes up like the diameter squared. So you get to multiply those together. Uh, and so in some settings, it goes like the fourth power. That is the, the quality of the image. goes like the fourth power, 81 times better than the current state of the art. This seems worth doing. Get things that are you know, roughly 100 times better. That's usually good uh, from the ground. And of course, if you do it from the ground, 
The good thing is you can go fix it or you can upgrade the instrument. At JWST, you're not going to go visit JWST. You know, they fixed the Hubble Space Telescope. It's in a low Earth orbit. Uh, they're not going to do that again either, as far as I can tell. Uh, but there's no going up to the JWST. Uh, so this is good. We're going to be able to improve things over time. Now, what about those? Well, so let me show you an example where this kind of thing really helps. Uh, I said that there are black holes in the centers of galaxies. Well, there's a black hole in the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And uh, this simulation, I think it was the key. Right? Okay, this is more or less what you see. It, uh, the first image is what you see just with the natural blur in the Earth's atmosphere. It goes a little fast, but come on. All right. The second image is what you get with the Keck telescope, state of the art today. And you can see the individual stars orbiting around something in there. And that something is a black hole uh, with about 10 million times the mass of the sun. So there really is a black hole in the center of our galaxy. You can trace the orbits and see what's going on. And what this simulation shows is if you had a 30 meter telescope with that kind of sharp imaging that I was talking about before, you get a lot more stars, you get to see in closer to the black hole, and you can go beyond some things like measuring the mass of the black hole onto questions about is general relativity exactly right? Is the black hole spinning? Other interesting questions that uh, we're not quite up to answering yet. Okay, keep going. And this was a good thing. Uh, Andrew Getz, shown here, um, won the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics for her work on the uh, black hole in the Milky Way. And, you know, you don't want to be too chauvinistic about it, but it would be great if people from the US were able to be, you know, on the stage in Stockholm, not just up in the uh, balcony. Uh, can't spell astronomers. Uh, and the people in the, our, our organization include uh, Caltech and the University of California, where Andrea is a professor. Okay, and just for amusement, here's Moore's Law for telescopes. How big are telescopes as a function of time? Well, back here is Galileo's telescope. Okay. And then over the centuries, this is not every two years. <laughs> and that get better every two years. It's better every 50 years. Anyway, over 100 years, 1800s, the diameter of mirror te of telescope uh, optics, mostly lenses at the beginning, biggest coffee table. 1900 up here, this is Mount Wilson. That was the pioneering place in the world in uh, early 1900s. The 60 inch and the 100 inch telescope are shown there, and Palomar. Of course, the 200 inch telescope, those are those three dots along there, all Southern California things. And then uh, up beyond are the Keck telescopes, uh, the European very large telescope, there's a thing called Gemini and so on. And the ones we're gonna build out here, pretty soon, I hope, uh, are the GMT and the TMT that I discussed. Together, we call ourselves the United States Extremely Large Telescope Program. We're very attached. Uh, and the Europeans are building a big one, too, in Chile. So that's good. And uh, we're doing it right here. So here is, I said the mirror is made up of hexagons. It's not a big piece of glass. Each piece of glass, glassy thing, is 1.4 meters. Cross. It's not huge, but there are 492 of them in the in the uh, aperture of the telescope. And then you can so this is the glass, and then it, we haven't coated it, so you can see through it. It's nice, and you see this really complicated telescope support structure that you helped work on. Uh, it has 21 degrees of freedom and has a lot of complicated stuff. The way the mirror is kept the right shape is that there are edge, there are sensors on each edge, 
that allows you to measure the position of one mirror relative to the others. And it turns out you can get the whole telescope 30 meters across the size of a baseball infield to be phased up to a wavelength of light by very, very carefully uh, uh, controlling all these things. And you, we know we can do it because we do it at the Keck telescope at 10 meters now. Okay, so uh, this is in Monrovia. Uh, it's an inter our partnership is international. Uh, our friends from India were there uh, last month, last month, January, yes. That's, that's uh, and so here are some of the officials of the Department of Science and Technology in India. And some of our guys are on each end. <laughs> they seem big. <laughs> and the thing in the back, uh, in this really nondescript uh, place next to an auto body shop in uh, Monrovia, is uh, a mock up piece of the structure for the telescope. That big telescope has a big steel structure. This is 170th of the size of the telescope that has seven mirrors. The whole telescope has 490. So uh, it just begins to give you a sense of the scale of this thing. Okay. And this is, I just like this. We're, we're keeping track of the mirrors. We've made 100. We need 492. Well, that's not enough. You gotta make a whole bunch of spares so that you can swap them in and out. You need another six for a total of 574. Woo! We're at 100. That's pretty good. We're on the path, huh? Uh, I just want to close by saying the instruments are really important. The scientific questions are really interesting. The potential is real. And the technology is being developed right here in the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, when Tom Rosenbaum, who's the Caltech president, went up to Palomar not so long ago, uh, he was very impressed with the old telescope still doing a good job. Telescope for exactly the same age. <laughs> anyway, he said the telescope is a powerful reminder of the scientific payoffs that can result from the combination of persistence and ingenuity built on the foundation of engineering prowess. Pretty good. Persistence and ingenuity. So that's what we're up to. Uh, I think uh, I'd be happy to answer your questions about the telescope or any astronomical question. Uh, so I'll stop and it's your turn. Thank you. It says up here, the clock has been going for 93 minutes. That can't be. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> it is. It has to be. Started. It's all fine. Yeah. So, do you have any limitations in terms of rare earth materials in building the system? Are there rare? Uh, that's an interesting question. Are there materials? But you know, the the, stru the telescope structure is steel. Right. That's a come on. The building is concrete. Mm -hmm. that, uh, but within the within yeah, I know the you're getting. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get to it. Uh, inside the instruments, the infrared detectors are very expensive because there are things like in the in and so on. It's not that they're uh, that it, they are. It is you know, have to find them for things, but it's really the processing that is so specialized uh, for those. Um, but it's an interesting question, and there are technological things where we run into supply problems. Um, you know, those uh, uh, those uh, Bitcoin people keep buying the computers that we need, and there was a lot, especially during the uh, uh pandemic, you could not get the graphics processing stuff that you needed for the. For some of our uh, some, uh, yeah, hardware. proof of state. <laughs> so, so you know, yeah, if they would give us some, that would be all right. yeah. So the glass panels are they actually ground to a curvature and then you simply um, bend them so as keep them aligned, or are they flattened? Yeah, to achieve good question. 
Uh, this was the process for doing this was invented for the Keck telescope, in which the mirrors are actually bent side by side and polished to a sphere. Something or other up there. And the bending is done so that when it relaxes, That's you take off the portions. It's the not quite a sphere shape that you want. Uh, so this, this sounds crazy. But in fact, it works. The place that does it uh, is called Coherent. They did the JWST mirrors. They did the Keck mirrors. They're the A team. Uh, and we have, have them working on this. Uh, they're up in the Bay Area. Uh, and uh, they're churning along. They send out several each month. Now, our colleagues in India spent a whole year there uh, in Richmond, California, and then bought from Coherent a whole set of the equipment. They built outside of Bangalore, much nicer factory, <laughs> new, clean, uh, and they set it up, and they're going to manufacture some of the mirrors too. So for them, it's a big win. They learned to do a new technological thing at the frontier. For us, it's a big win because we have another, you know, another production line. Uh, and uh, we have other partners who are doing So the Japanese are building the called substructure. They designed it and built it back. Uh, Canadians are going to supply that funny looking dome. Um, and uh, well, I'm going to miss the name. Our, our international partners are helping. Caltech and UC uh, have contributed quite a lot of cash, uh, most of it from Gordon and Betty Moore. So, so are you pre-stressing the structure as well? Uh, the structure, not, no, 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 no. The structure, we do have actuators that allow us to push against the structure. And we define very well what the structure is and the positions and so on of each of the nodes. But we don't bend it. We don't bend it. Gravity bends it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, Converting the telescope, will it be, in a sense, assisted by AI? Because I believe it's Professor Cal, Cal Poly, who is doing research in AI for early, for actually beginning first stars, uh, dead stars, obviously. But yeah. Uh, I was wondering because like, she actually brought up a lot of AI into recording the earliest, earliest stages of the uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, it turns out I didn't know I was doing it when, you know, 15 years ago. You had this training set, learning how to model the data. Geez, uh, we were doing all this stuff that I uh, could have. But uh, uh, you know, we were, that the analysis of data in astronomy uh, using artificial intelligence is something that people have been doing without knowing the name of it for a while, and now it's a big deal. The data rate for this telescope will not be gigantically high because the field is fairly small. But there are other telescopes, survey telescopes, uh, that are being built now where it's a terabyte a night. And there's just no way to look at it. You've got to pick out the things that you're going to want from that catalog based on the time series or the other aspects of the data. So uh, I think in astronomy, there has been pretty big data for a while. Uh, when we were doing this uh, supernova uh, stuff for cosmic acceleration, we had the images which were and we'd subtract them and find the things that changed and so on we thought that was big data back then but it was really only uh you know a few megabits of cameras and 100 pictures a night so you know that's how much stuff we had to process and well we had to do it fast because the supernovae get bright and they get dim over time you can't come back next year so uh we learned how to do certain kinds of uh, data analysis pretty well. I would say astronomy is uh, a field where there is a lot, have been many very productive applications of the, you know, that whole class of uh, mathematical tools. Yeah. Uh, so two questions. Uh, first is a little technical. Um, so I'm curious about the 400 plus mirrors. Yeah. And you're having to reposition the, the telescope yeah. uh, to look at something 
you know, look at the profit. Yeah. How long does it take to actually recalibrate all this? Well, we don't have to do that. So, so you just gravity. gravity. We have a model. We have a model for the gravity deflection. Right. But adaptive optics take place not with the primary mirror, but later. So the mirrors so smaller. The particle that part of plus mirrors is not. Uh, so that doesn't figure. So when you move that thing, it's not going to stress it out a little oh, bit. Oh, it does. But we we have we'll have a model to uh, for the displacement. So no downtime on actual science. Figures. No, the actual no about once a week. Yeah. Once a week you have to face off. And the second question is, did you ever meet the Carl Sagan? Yes, <laughs> I met Carl Sagan. Uh, I, it was at the offices of the Scientific American, and uh, they were going to write a special. Article on, um, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I was writing the article on where the chemical elements came from because they come from these supernova explosions. And Carl Sagan was there, and he wrote the introduction or something. I don't know. So the answer is yes, I've met him, uh, but I don't know him very well, except you know through his public. Uh, now Neil deGrasse Tyson, I've written papers. Neil Tyson, back when he was really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what visible or what spectrum are you are you looking at here? Like yeah. visible and red. What yeah, we're going to. Uh, Monica is really good. It's very high, almost fourteen thousand feet. And uh, so the scattering of ultraviolet light is reduced. So we're going to go as far into the ultraviolet as we can. That's limited by ozone, and it's about 3,100 uh, inches. Uh, at the long wavelength end, of course, as I mentioned, there are molecules, you no know, water, terrible thing. If you're on the summit of Mauna Kea, your lips get chapped real fast. It's a humidity. And the precipitable water from there to the top of the atmosphere, uh, it's pretty small, it could be a few millimeters. And so it's one of the best places in the world for infrared astronomy. There are molecules that block out some parts and there are molecules, and of course they're warm, so they're emitting. Uh, but you know, there's a whole world of, of infrared astronomy that uses those windows. And we are gonna do some of that too. The um, adaptive optics that I talked about is easier in the infrared than it is in the optical. So that's going to be a primary thing that we do. So we're building one of the first light instruments to be uh, a big infrared camera uh, and spectrograph, very complicated thing. But anyway, uh, working at um, one, uh, uh, 1.6 and 2.2 microns. So where there are windows, where the molecules let you let you see what's going on. Uh, yeah. Can you say more about the business in particular? How much money has been spent so far? How much do you need to finish? Yeah. Where are you going to get it? And is there a risk? Yes. Need? Yes. 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 I will <laughs> tell you. I won't tell you everything. But uh, yeah. Uh, Gordon and Betty Moore uh, helped Caltech and UC get this thing going. Then they recruited international partners. The amount of money pledged and spent, I'll say a couple hundred million. Um, the contributions in kind will be bigger than that, or as, yeah, bigger than that. Uh, and we have gone to the US National Science Foundation with a proposal to fund basically half of the telescope. We went hand in hand with our partners uh, at the G and T, and the cost for all of the U.S. national part, which would be half of each of the telescopes, is about three billion dollars, which is a lot. But what we say is, you know, it's only if you could pay it over a decade, a million. That's not so great in Washington. And uh, well, we'll see how that goes forward. Uh, it's all hanging in the balance right now. We've written the proposal. They have provided us some funds for design and development, but the big money for construction is pending uh, budget action in Washington. I left off. <laughs> and uh, it's pending uh, 
for this for us the site in Hawaii clearly we have to get an agreement with uh, uh, people again with that Mauna Kea stewardship authority about what the terms would be for uh, using the site. So yes, is there risk? There sure is, and some of it's financial, some of it's uh, whatever political, some of it is um, well making a proper um, agreement with uh, the indigenous people in, in Hong Kong. And those are tricky things. You know, you go to Caltech as a graduate student, they we don't learn too much about that. <laughs> and I think we just have to find a better way to do these big science projects where you often want to be in some place of, uh, you know, the population is uh, the indigenous people. It's true in Australia. Uh, where big radio telescopes are being built. It's going to be true in the U.S. Uh, uh, in the continental U.S., when you build a big radio telescope uh, array, there's going to be lots of that. It's going to be on tribal lands. It's going to have to be some better way to deal with people than we've been used to in the past. And so we're really working. If everything goes perfect, when wins first light. If we had all the money today, we could do it by 2035. Uh, we don't have the money. So it's going to be after that. Uh, but maybe only uh, You know, I'm not going to do it. Maybe you'll get the I don't know. But uh, it's. Uh, 2035. If they had all the money. And the permission. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are, there, are there any planned experiments between the EMP and PMP that will be like binocular vision of some sort? Uh, there or... certainly will be cooperation. There are sometimes objects that are uh, transient. <laughs> and <laughs> so they go up fast and they come down fast. If that? you have uh, separation in longitude, as we would, you, you could watch one of them for a while from Chile. And then uh, watch it from Hawaii. Uh, they're separated by uh, between four and six hours. I forget. Uh, you know, the coast, the west coast of South America is east of Florida. So, you know, it's it, it's a bigger span than you, than you might think. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, first of all, I, I would like to say I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I, I have heard of the 30 meter telescope. Before um, when we use, but I I actually didn't know that the production of the mirrors is actually here in our backyard and yeah. in, in my hometown of Georgia. So that, yeah. that, that, that's not a fantastic. That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. but my, my question is um, because I'm not an engineer, um, but why, why why do you choose to have this project or this telescope? In Mauna Kea specifically versus anywhere else around the It's the best site. It's because of the high altitude, the low humidity, the low water vapor, uh, and a very stable air. You know, it's so, so it's kind of ironic. You're on an island in the middle of an ocean and it's very dry. But it's pressure so high, you're above the inversion layer in your atmosphere. And uh, uh, it's really interesting when you're up there and the sun goes down. The air cools off, and that layer, which is the layer where the uh, moist air from the ground uh, can penetrate, which has the biology, and uh, the summit of them is up above the top. It happens here, uh, Mount Wilson, you see that, uh, you know, those crummy June days when it's so gray and horrible. Often at night, it's great up on the top at the zone. So um, that's the reason. I think also, you know, we're asking a lot of money from the United States Treasury and having it in the United States of America is a good idea. Although many people in Hawaii are not so sure that Hawaii is part of the United States of America. <laughs> well, you know, that is part of it. That is part of it. So, yeah. Question about oh, I did, but it, yeah, this looks to be a quick one. So your your laser guide star. Yeah. Um, so has that evolved over time, or is it pretty much been the same 
technology sensitive. No, it's been evolved, evolved quite a bit because you want to have uh, um, a system that is sensitive to the turbulence at different layers in the atmosphere, multi conjugate adaptive optics. And so you send up several constellations of asteroids and right? So it's not just one dot. Really in and we have a bunch of them. Um, so uh, the answer is, and especially over a big aperture, in order, you know, you're seeing a different bit of the atmosphere, so you have to compensate for all of that stuff. So there's plenty of room to do better. Uh, and the, I think, oh, I don't know the military stuff, but in the astronomical setting, um, this uh, has advanced quite a lot. Yeah, um, just kind of an observation, comment, and question. In your graph of uh, time versus size of the telescope, right at the top, the ELT is actually above the line. Yeah. It, should, it should be like 2100 by that. That's an observation. A little above the telescope before it's. Yeah. Tell us a little bit better. If it actually is done, it'll probably they're doing very well. They have a very good funding situation. European technology is fine, they're up to it. They're, we, we've helped them a lot. Well, we were ahead of them, we helped them a lot. Now we're a little behind, but we don't get the funding properly. But uh, they've been very systematic and they are directing the structure now. The comment is you mentioned. Why you showed the deep learning? Why wouldn't anybody do that? I worked with George, with George Stroke in 1971. He had published a paper on deep learning with coherent optics, mm -hmm. and he submitted it for review. And that one of the reviewers said, "Why would we want to do this? I mean, so you can't predict based on just because you like." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I think you know that's part of the uh, reason why you, uh, you have to nourish imagination. And you have to, you know, things that look useless. Well, this is actually peer reviewed papers. No, yeah, no, but you know, they they're saying, you know, <laughs> uh, I think uh, you 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 shouldn't be too hasty to judge the utility of something, especially you know, here it is fifty years later. And the other the question I had, quick question. Recently, they've discovered this super ring of galaxies that they're talking about. So, yeah. is there any chance that's a lens, the artifact of the lens? I think it's an artifact of the lens. Well, about eight o'clock, so any lab for any questions? If not, then. <laughs> It was a pleasure. You're a great audience. And uh, well, where did you say the beer was? I mean, the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if people want to join us, we're just going to go over to Carrera's um, across the street and uh, continue talking. <laughs> this topic, we're going to have a little bit of a talk about it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.